So I'm trying to delve a little bit into this more qualitative analysis of expectations and uh, uh, factors related to to um, to migration. How can I do this way? Okay. So I mean, I'm trying to discuss in my paper uh, uh, a couple of questions that are inspiring my my research in in. in in the last time, and related to the kind of expectation, aspiration, and hopes that feed the desire to move, and particularly in some countries where, where I've been doing uh, research. And, what th and also try to infer the, the kind of, the, the, the subjective and moral underpinnings of this desire in the in contemporary times. Um, I uh, built on, uh, two di very different experiences. Uh, my work as a psychologist in a center for the mental health of immigrants in northern Italy. It's a very strange context, but very interesting and a very, uh, I think, uh, uh, significant observing point on the, the deep motivations and stories of, of people. And on the other hand, a more classical anthropological ethnographic fieldwork uh, in Morocco since 2001 and in Tunisia from 2010 onwards. Um, I'm a little bit intimidated by your methodological rigor, so I'm <laughs> trying to make explicit uh, my methodology, which is actually normally the methodology of one hand, one, a, psycho a clinical psychologist working with people, so <laughs> making clinical interviews and uh, accessing life stories and trying to reflect with, with the interlocutors about their life stories, and also the classical multi-sided multi ethnographic fieldwork, etc. Um, I think that my reflection can be uh, um, can be framed within a social transformation perspective in some way. I mean, my idea is to observe uh, from a subjective point of view how the struggle changes of the so of the so-called globalization affects and influence what you've seen in feeling space, relations, uh, and mobility. So, uh, quick vignette in my first fieldwork in Morocco in 2001, I took a taxi, and the taxi driver started inquiring into my, my origins, like always happens in Morocco, and uh, uh, as, uh, as soon as he realized that I'm, uh, I'm Italian, he started asking about the possibility to go to Italy, to migrate to Italy, and in the end, also if I could help him to go there, actually. <laughs> um, and uh, um, I remember I started discussing with him, asking why, and he told me something that I would have listened to so many times across the years. So there are no possibilities, uh, life is difficult and supporting the family is, diff is hard. And I quite ingeniously replied that it at least could rely on a taxi. And he told me, a little bit upset, je te parle du vide digne. I'm talking about a decent life. So I think that this idea of what is a decent life, it's something that interrogates my my uh, reflection and, uh, in, uh, across this, these years. And basically because, um, I mean, a great deal of the analysis and public discourses on migration insists very much uh, on putting at the roots uh, condition of under, underdevelopment, poverty, structural violence and conflicts. I think that this is due to basically two, two reasons. One, sedentary bias. Uh, that uh, make people think that actually it's better to stay at home than moving, and a kind of humanitarian discourse about about uh, the fact that uh, we should allow people to move because there are some catastrophic events or disasters that uh, uh, we have to recognize as a as a basic uh, reason of their their will to move. So. Actually, many experiences of my interlocutors, uh, either in, in, in my clinical work 
uh, or in, in Morocco and Tunisia actually did take shape in context of marginality and social suffering. And life by them was often depicted as an experience of inferiority, I quote J Jameson. But I think that this happens also because life in those contexts is considerably different from some hegemonic benchmarks of well-being which define the idea of a decent life today. So my argument is twofold. So from one hand, we face in some countries some historical conditions that hinder the access to local resources of social reproduction, but I would say most importantly social promotion. And on the other hand, such differentially accessible resources become emblematic of what may be considered a decent life in the current global moments. So, um, in the popular neighborhoods uh, and in the rural areas of Morocco and Tunisia, as in many other places of the contemporary world, such, such standards orient uh, a powerful representation of what is desirable and, as a consequence, is desired. So, as a Moroccan boy put it some years ago, uh, it's, this is a quite common and redundant uh, testimony. I mean, the, idea, the, the image of the returning immigrants and their ostentative uh, signs of their success. I mean, this is a very well-known phenomenon and, and, and uh, uh, dynamic. But also the idea of comparison with this destiny and the destiny that one expects to have at home. So the idea that uh, if my neighbor is maqarish, is ignorant, is, uh, is illiterate, what I can do that I studied and I did something, something more than him. So um, the images of, the visit, of visiting immigrants are frequently described as the tangible evidence of a two-speed world. On the one hand, a time deemed repetitive and hopelessly mzayer, shrunk, squeezed, uh, in a condition of uh, isolation uh, and uh, in a feeling in, 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 of um, a widespread and generalized feeling of, of being humiliated for one's own condition. Hogra, for example, is a word which was, became very important during the so-called Arab Spring, one of the keywords of the Arab Spring, to was uh, opposed the idea of karama, dignity the claim and the revendication of it. So, from one end, this time, repetitive and hopelessly time, and from the other, the idea of a, a shortcut, to get access quickly through mobility to another possible future. Make, made of speed, opportunities, and the visible materiality of success. So, it's interesting, I find it interesting, that this new status, coveted status, is very often uh, termed or imagined through the idea of modernity. The idea of modernity is frequently used to synthetically qualify the overall transformations of the world and their associated possibilities. So I'm perfectly aware that the notion is normative, and, uh, but it's not in the sense of a linear and necessary progress from simple to complex or from primitive to civilized. I didn't mean to use it, of course. I use it, as Jane Ferguson did, as a native category shared by the normalcy, heterogeneous population of natives, that is, as an emic category. So, in different places, as I could notice, this concept of modernity uh, is, not, is no longer understood as an hegemonic tool of a colonial or post-colonial imposition of values and norms, but as an alluring form of being in the world that has to be taken up and commanded, at least in some of its 
most important feature. This does not imply, of course, the absence of local resistance to some aspects, aspects but a general attitude whereby people are called to compare themselves with a lifestyle which typifies success and self-improvement. So, as a matter of fact, in many places of the world, and certainly where I've been producing fieldwork, um, the feeling of exclusion is specifically thought of as the personal distance from the imagined possibilities of material acquisition. So, in, in a way, normal and normative things represent this, those material achievements that contribute to shape an acceptable form of life today. Achille Mbem defined this form of moral relative deprivation, deprivation as an economy unfulfilled desires. And the word desire, I think it's a very appropriate word to, to define this, this process. So, oh my God. So, um, in a critical stance, uh, an author working on, on, on consumption, Alan Aldridge, observed that in a situation of insecurity and crisis, consumption becomes a, com a compensatory investment uh, in which to negotiate identity, belongings, and self-fulfillment. But in my view, this perspective doesn't, does not take into account that consumption is one of the basic forms of our being in the world today. And uh, one of my main features of contemporary experience of, of uh, the, city, the global citizen consumers, consumer in the late ca capitalist era, I mean, is a basic feature. So it's not surprising that uh, among migrants or migrants-to-be, the desire for a better life may be expressed through a specific lexicon of things, revealing the moral value of commodities as objects of comfort. And I quote Daniel Miller, sign of personal success, but also common means, a normal means to keep alive ties and solidarities. So, uh, its form are certainly shaped by an industry of induced needs that creates new discursive and material hegemonies uh, in order to make profits. But at the same time, people appropriate this appropriate, these new means and meanings, and through them mold new possibilities. I'm sorry. What is going on? Okay, I, 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 missed, I missed one part, but no problem. <laughs> um, yes, Ashin Bembe called it uh, uh, an economy of fulfilled desire, and James Ferguson objection, object, objection, so the combination and awareness of privileged first class worlds and the difference of one's own world. And in this case, this testimony talk about this, no, this value of the normative things. I'll show to the eyes the basics of life, which is buy a, car, a house, having a car, keeping a cell phone recharge, a quiet life, basically. That is, actually, it is our life. And, and of course, I was looking for a solution and I thought I'd go and sacrifice myself. And this introduces, uh, these are some images uh, of this success in the area and this, this global imaginary. This is a, co a coffee house in Tunis dedicated to Facebook. And this is a, a coffee house <laughs> in, in, in Tangier. <laughs> Dedicated, of course, to <laughs> of course to this this uh, this situation. So I mean, um, this idea of the things of today, the material stuff that does and that supported underpins our our way of being alive today, is very often they reported as a, an important and structural factor. Yeah, this is the quotation that I was looking at before. So people use this and draw on shared resources to construct and embedded their own collective fantasies. 
But I shift quickly towards the end. A second point is that quotation of Michael Jackson, the anthropologist, not the singer. <laughs> <laughs> this is obvious. But uh, the idea of the fact that the anthropologists were trained to observe and study immobile society, repetitive society, in which the, the I mean, the uh, um, most significant expectation of the young people was to become as their fathers. And I, I met a lot of young boys saying, I can no longer be like my father. They were justifying. I remember this, this boy, this Tunisian boy arrived in Italy after the Arab uprising and he said, I'm here because I, cannot, I can no longer live like my father. This is an historic change in some places. And I think that some anthropologists are starting working on it, but it's a huge field of exploration. So um, I have another.